The Cube's live coverage is made possible by funding from Dell Technologies, creating technologies that drive human progress. We're back in Barcelona at the FIRA. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with David Nicholson. We're live at MWC 23, day four of the coverage. The show is still rocking. You walk the floor, it's jamming. People are lined up to get in the, in the copter, and the, <laughs> right? It's amazing. Planes, trains, automobiles, digitization of analog businesses. We're going to talk private wireless here with Dell. Sarvesh Sharma is the global director for edge and private mobility solutions practice at Dell, and John McCready is the senior director for 5G solutions and product management at Dell Technologies. Guys, good to see you. Likewise, see you likewise. Too. Private wireless, it's the buzz of the show, everybody's talking about it. What's Dell's point of view on that? So Dell is uh, obviously an interesting into the private wireless game as it's a good part of the overall enterprise IT space as you move more, more and more into the different things. What we've announced here, is a sort of our initial partnerships with some key players like Airspan and Expedo and Athenet, players that are important in the space. Dell's going to provide an overall system integration, solution wrap, along with our Edge BU as well, and we think that we can bring uh, really good solutions to our enterprise customers. That okay, way. I got to ask you about Athenet. So HPE pulled a little judo move, they waited till you announced your partnership and then they bought the company. What, you know, what do you, what's your opinion on that? You're going you're gonna to dump Athenet? You're going to keep them? No. We're our, an open our, ecosystem. We, yeah, it's an open ecosystem. We announced these are our initial partners. You know, we're going to announce additional partners. That was always the case. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good players in the space that bring different pros and cons. We, we got to be able to match the solution requirements of all our customers. And so we'll continue yeah. to, to partner with them and with others. Good, good answer, I like that. So, some of these solutions are sort of out of the box. Others require more integration. Can you talk about your, the spectrum of your portfolio? So, I'm glad you brought up the integration part, right? I mean, if you look at private wireless, private mobility, it is not a cell by itself. At the end of the day, what the enterprise wants is not just private mobility, they're looking for an outcome. Which means from an integration perspective, you need somebody who can integrate the infrastructure stack, but that's not enough. You need somebody who can bring in the application stack to play and integrate that application stack with the enterprise's ITOT. And that's not enough. You need somebody to put those together. And Dell is ideally suited to do all of this, right? We have strong partners that can bring the infrastructure stack to play. We have a proven track record of managing the IT and the enterprise stack. So we are very excited to say, hey, this is the sweet spot for us, and if there was a right to win the edge, we have it. Can you explain, I mean, people might be saying, well, why do I even need private wireless? I I got Wi-Fi, I know it's kind of a dumb question for people who are in the business, but explain to folks in the audience who may not understand the intersection of the two. So, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, wireless is a great technology, pardon me, Wi-Fi is a great technology yes. for taking your laptop to the conference room. You know, it's effectively wireless LAN. Where private 5G, and, and before that private LTE had come into play, is where there's a number of attributes of your application, what you're using it for, for which Wi-Fi is not as well suited. And so, you know, that plays out in different verticals in different ways. Either maybe you need uh, much higher capacity than Wi-Fi, better security than Wi-Fi, wider coverage like outdoor, uh, uh, and, and in many cases, a, a more predictable reliability. So cellular is just a different way of handling the, the wireless interface that provides those attributes. So, you know, I think at the beginning, first, the first several years, you know, Wi-Fi and 5G are going to live side by side in the enterprise for their different roles. Mm -hmm. How that plays out in the long term, we'll see how they each evolve. Yeah. But I think anybody can relate to that. I mean, Wi-Fi's fine. You know, we have our issues with Wi-Fi. I'm having a lot of issues right. with Wi-Fi this week. <laughs> but generally speaking, it works just fine. It's ubiquitous, it's yeah. cheap. Okay, but I would not want to run my factory on it and yeah. rely on it yeah. for my robots that are shipping products, yeah. right? Yeah. So that really is kind of the difference. It's really an industry 4.0 right. type of Yeah, product. exactly. So, I mean, manufacturing is an important vertical, but things of uh, energy and mining and things like that, they're all outdoor, right? Yeah. So you actually need the scale that comes with a, with a higher power technology. And, and even, uh, you know, just basic things like uh, running cameras in a retail store and using AI to watch for certain things, you get a much better latency performance on private 5G and therefore, are able to run more sophisticated applications. So I could be doing real-time inference, I can imagine, Dave, I got an ARM processor, I'm doing some real-time inference AI at the edge. You know, you, you, need, <laughs> you need something like 5G right. to be able to exactly. do that. You can't be doing that over Wi-Fi. Yeah. You nailed it, I mean, that, that's exactly the difference, right? I mean, if you look at 
Wi-Fi, it grow up from a IT enabled mode, right? You got to replace an ethernet, it was an IT extension, a LAN extension. Cellular came up from the mode of, hey, when I have that call, I need for it to be consistent and I need for it to be always available, right? So it's a different way of looking at it, not to say one is better, the other is not better. It's just a different philosophy behind the technologies and they're going to coexist because they meet diverse needs. Now you have operators who embrace the idea of 5G, obviously, and even private 5G, but the sort of next hurdle to overcome for some is the idea of open standards. What is what does the landscape look like right now in terms of those conversations? Are you still having to push people over that hump to get them beyond the legacy of proprietary closed stacks? Yeah, so I think, uh, look, there are still people who are advocating that, and I think in the carrier's core networks, it's going to take a little longer, their main you know, macro networks that they serve the general public. In the private network, though, the opportunity to use uh, open standard and open technology is really strong because that's how you bring the innovation. And that's what we need in order to be able to solve all these different, different business problems. You know, the problems in retail and healthcare and energy, yeah. they're different. And so you need to be able to use this open stack and be able to bring different elements of technology and blend it together in order to serve it. Otherwise, we, we won't serve it, we'll all fail. Yeah. So that's why I think it's going to have an, uh, a quicker path in uh, right. private. And the, the only thing to add to that is if you look at private 5G and the deployment of private LTE or private 5G, right? There is no real technology debt that you carry. So it's easy for us to say, hey, the operators are not listening, they're not going open, but hey, they have a technical debt. They have 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G sure. systems, right? But the reason we are so excited about private 5G and private 4G is right off the bat, when we go into an enterprise space, we can go open. So, what exactly is Dell's role here? Um, how, how do you see, obviously you make hardware and, and you have solutions, but you got to open ecosystems, you got, you know, you got labs. You got, what, what, what do you see your role in the ecosystem? You're kind of a disruptor here in right. this when yeah. I walk around this show. Well, a, a disruptor, uh, also a solution provider and system mm -hmm. integrator. You know, uh, Sarvesh and I are part of the telecom practice. We have a big edge practice in Dell as well. Right. And so for this space around private 5G, we're really teamed up with our, with our cohort in the, in the edge business unit. And think about this as, it's not just private 5G, it's what are you doing with it? That, drive, that requires storage, it requires compute, it requires other applications. So Dell to bring that entire package. There definitely are players who are just focused on the connectivity, but our view is that that's not enough. To ask the enterprise to integrate that all themselves, I don't think that's going to work. You need to bring the connectivity and the application, the storage, compute, the whole solution. Right. So explain telecom and, and edge. They're, they're different, but they're like cousins in the Dell organization. How, where do you guys divide the two? You're saying within Dell? Yeah, within Dell. Yeah. So if you look at Dell, right? Um, telecom is one of our most newest uh, business units. And the way it has formed is like, we talk edge all the time, right? It's not new. Edge has always been around. So our enterprise edge has always been around. What has changed with 5G is now, you can seamlessly move between the enterprise edge and the telecom edge. And for that to happen, you had to bring in a telecom systems business unit that can facilitate that evolution, the next evolution of seamless edge that goes across from enterprise all the way into the telco and other places where edge needs to be. Same right? question for the market, because I remember at Dell Tech World last year, I interviewed Lowe's, and the discussion was about the edge. Yep. How they're, what they're doing in their edge locations. So that's edge, that's cool, but then, I had, I had another discussion with um, a, 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 an agriculture firm. Mm -hmm. They had like the massive greenhouses and they were growing these uh -huh. awesome tomatoes. Well, that was edge too. It yeah. was actually further edge. So I guess those are both edge, right? Yeah, There's yeah, a yeah. spectrum it's, there. Right. And then the telecom business, business now you're saying is, is more closely aligned with that. Right. Depending on what you're trying to do, the appropriate place for the edge is different. You, you nailed yeah, it exactly, yeah. right? So if you need wide area low latency, the edge being in the telecom network actually makes a lot of sense because they can serve wide area low latency. If you're just doing your manufacturing plant or your logistics facility or your, your agricultural uh, uh, growing site, that's the edge. So that's exactly right. And, and the, tech, the reason why they're close cousins between telecom and that is you're going to need some connectivity, some kind of connectivity from that edge in order to execute whatever it is you're, you're trying to do with your business. Right. Yeah. Right. Nature's Fresh was the company. I couldn't I think, think of Nature's Fresh. Right. Great, right. Keith, right. awesome, awesome yeah. Cube guest. Right. Do you, you, you mentioned this mix of Wi-Fi and 5G. I know it's impossible to predict with dates certain you know, when this, when, when this, how this is going to develop, but can you imagine a scenario where at some point in time, 
We don't think in terms of Wi-Fi because everything is essentially enabled by a SIM, or am I missing a critical piece there in terms of, in terms of uh, management of spectrum and the complicated governmental yeah, there situation? Is, am there I missing something? It seems like a logical progression to me, right, but what right. am I missing? Well, there is something to be said about spectrum, right? If you look at Wi-Fi, as I said, the driver behind the technology is different. However, I fully agree with you that at some point in time, whether it's Wi-Fi behind, whether it's private 5G behind, becomes a moot point. It's simply a matter of where is my data being generated, what is the best technology for me to use to ingest that data so I can derive value out of that data. If it means Wi-Fi, so be it. If it means uh, cellular, so be it. And if you look at cellular, right, the biggest thing people talk about, SIMs. Now if you look at 5G standard, in 5G standard you have EAP TLS, which means there is a possibility that SIMs in the future go away for IoT devices. I'm not saying they need to go away for consumer devices, they probably need to be there, but who's to say going ahead for IoT devices, they all become SIM free. So at that point, whether you're Wi-Fi or 5G, doesn't matter. Yeah. By the way, on the spectrum side, people are starting to th think about the concept, uh, you might have heard this, NRU, New Radio Unlicensed. So it's running the Wi-Fi standard, but in the unlicensed bands, like Wi-Fi. Okay. So, and, and then the last piece is, of course, you know, the cost. The reality is, that 5G is still new, to, new technology. The endpoints, you know, what would go in your laptop or a sensor, et cetera. Today, that's more expensive than Wi-Fi. So we need to get the volume curve down a little bit for that to, to really hit every application. I would guess your vision is correct, yep. but who can predict? Yeah. So explain more about what the unlicensed piece means for organizations. What does yeah. that mean so for that, That's more of a future thing, so yeah. you know, just no, no, the, the right. idea. But, but, but let's put on our telescope. Okay, so it's binoculars. true today that Wi-Fi traditionally runs in the bands that have been licensed by the government, and it's a country by country thing, right? right? What we did in the United States with CBRS is different than what they've done in Germany, where sure. they took part of the C-band and gave it to the enterprises, so the telco's not involved. And now that, that's been copied in Japan and Korea. So it's one of the complications, unfortunately, of the market is that you have this different approach by regulators in different countries. Wi-Fi, the unlicensed band, is a nice global standard. Yeah. So if you could run, NR just is 5G, right? It's another name for 5G. Run that in the unlicensed bands, then you solve the spectrum problem that Dave was asking about. Right. Which right. means that the market really opens up. And now you it have would be a real enabler. Innovation. Right. And exactly. And the only thing I would add to that is, right, there are some enterprises who have the size and scale to kind of say, hey, I'm going the unlicensed route, I can do things on my own. There are some enterprises that still are going to rely on the telcos, right? So I don't want to make a demon out of the telcos that you own the spectrum, no. Sure. They will be offering a very valuable service to a massive number of small, yeah. medium enterprises and enterprises that span regional boundaries to say, hey, we can bring that consistent experience to you. But the yeah. primary value proposition has been connectivity. Right? Yes. I mean, we can all agree on that. And you hear different monetization models, we can't allow the OTT vendors to do it again. You know, we want to tax Netflix. Okay, we've been talking about that all week. But there may be better models, yes. right? And so, where does private network fit into the monetization models? Let's Act follow the money here. Actually, you've brought up an extremely important point, right? Because if you look at why haven't 5G networks taken off, one of the biggest things people keep contrasting is, what is the cost of a Wi-Fi versus the cost of deploying a 5G, right? And a portion of the cost of deploying a 5G is how do you commercialize that spectrum? What is going to be the cost of that spectrum, right? So the CSPs will have to eventually figure out a proper commercialization model to say, hey listen, I can't just take what I've been doing till date and say, this is how I make, because if you look at 5G, the return of investment is incremental. Any use case you take, unless, let's take smart manufacturing, unless the factory decides I'm going to rip and replace everything by 5G, they're going to introduce a small use case. You look at the investment for that use case, you'll say, mm, I'm not making money. But guess what? Once you've deployed it and you bring use case number two, three, four, five, now it starts to really add value. So how can a CSP acknowledge that and create commercial models to enable that is going to be key. Like one of the things that Dell does in terms of as a service solutions that we offer, I think that is a crucial way of really kickstarting 5G adoption. It's Metcalf's law adoption. in this world, right? The first telephone, eh, not a lot of value. Second, eh, right. I could call one person, but 
you know, if I can call a zillion, now it's valuable. Now you got data. Yep. Yeah, yeah so right. you, you, you used the phrase rip and replace. What percentage of the market that you are focusing on is the let's go in and replace something versus the let's help you digitally transform your business and this is a networking technology that we can use to help you digitally transform. Right. The example that you guys have with, uh, with the small brewery is a perfect right. example. Yeah. You help digitize, you know, digitally transform right. their business. Right. You weren't going in and saying, I see that you have these things connected via Wi-Fi, let's rip those out and put SIMs in. No. Nope. So, no. so you know. The That's exactly right. It's enabling new things that either couldn't be achieved before or weren't. Uh, so from a private 5G perspective, it's, it's not going to be rip and replace. As I said, I think we'll coexist with Wi-Fi, it's still got a great role. Uh, it's enabling those, solving those business problems that either hadn't been solved before or could not be solved with other technology. How are you guys using AI? Everybody's talking about ChatGPT, I love ChatGPT, we use it all the time. <laughs> love it, hate it, you know, whatever. It's all a fun topic, but AI generally is here in a way that it wasn't when the, the enterprise disaggregated. Right. So there's AI, there's automation, there's, there's opportunities there. How do they fit into private? Project? So if you look at it, right, AI, AI ML is actually crucial to value extraction from that data. Because all private 5G is doing is giving you access to that precious data. <coughs> but that data by itself means nothing, right? You get access to the data, extracting value out of the data that bring in business value is all going to be AI ML, whether it's computer vision, whether it's data analytics on the, on the fly so that you can you know, do your closed loop controls or what have you. All of these are going to be AI ML models. Does it play into automation as well? Absolutely, because they drive the automation. Yeah. Right, you learn, you, your AI models drive that automation. Control, closed loop control systems are a perfect example of that automation. Explain that further, like give us an example. So for example, let's, let's say we're talk, talking about a smart manufacturing, right? So you have widgets coming down the pipe, right? You have your uh, computer vision, you have your AI ML model that says, hey, I'm starting to detect a consistent error in the product being manufactured. I'm going to close loop that automation and either tweak the settings to the machine, shut down the machine, open a workflow, escalate it for human intervention. All that automation is facilitated by the AI ML models. And, that, and by the way, there's real money in that, right? If you're making your power, you're making it wrong, you don't detect it for hours, yes. there's real money in fixing that. Right. So I've got, a, I've got an example, albeit a slight, uh, not even slightly, but a tragic one. Let's say you have a train that's rolling down the tracks at every several miles or so, temperature readings are, taking, are, 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 are taken from bearings in yes. the train. Yes. Wouldn't it be nice to have that be happening in real time? Yes. So it doesn't reach that critical point where yes. then you have a derailment. Yes, yeah, I mean, absolutely. These are, those are, it's, doesn't sound sexy in terms of, hey, what a great business use case that we can monetize, Yeah. but I'll bet you in hindsight, that operator would have loved to have that capability, yeah, right. to be able to yeah. shut the train right. down that's and a, not you, run. That's a great example where the carrier is actually probably in a good position, right? Because you got wide area, you want low latency. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the traditional carriers would be able to, in great position to provide yeah. that exact service. Right. Telemetry is another great example. We right. We've been talking about uh, other kinds of automation, but just picking up measurements and so on. The, the other example of that is in oil and gas, right? As you've got pipelines running around, you're measuring pressure, temperature, you right. detect a leak right. in minutes, not weeks. Right. So there's a lot of good examples yeah. of things like that. To, to pick up on your point, Dave, you know, it's like you look at these big, huge super tankers, right? They have, yeah. they, private networks on that super tanker to monitor everything. If on this train we had, you know, you hear about so many edges, let's call one more, the rolling edge, <laughs> right? That, that edge is right on that locomotive, tracking everything with the IML models, detecting things, warning people ahead of time, shutting it down as needed, and that connectivity doesn't have to be wired. It can be a rolling wireless, it potentially could be a, spectrum that's you know open spectrum in the future, or as you said, an operator could facilitate that. So many options, right? Yeah, I, 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 I got to double down on this. Look, I know, because I've been involved in some of these projects, amusement park operators are doing this for rides. Yes. Yep. So that they can optimize the amount of time the ride is up, so they can l shorten lines, yes. so that they can get people into shops to buy food and souvenirs. Yes. Yep. Certainly we should be able to do it to protect Infrastructure, absolutely yeah. right. So, but uh, the, I think the ultimate point you're making is, 
it's actually quite finely segmented. There's so many different applications. And so that's why, again, we come back to what we started, started with, is at Dell we're bringing the solution from edge, compute, application, connectivity, and be able to bring that across all these different verticals and these different right. solutions. Yeah. The other amusement park example, by the way, is as the rides start to invest in virtual reality, so you're moving but you're seeing something, you need some technology like 5G to have low latency and keep that in sync and have a good experience on the ride. So right. 5G and beyond, gents. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. All right, great thank to you. Have you. Thank you, yeah, David. Great to meet Dave. you guys. Thank you very great. much. All right, keep it right there for Dave Nicholson and Dave Vellante. This is theCUBE's coverage of MWC 23. Check out siliconangle.com for all the news. Thecube.net is where all these videos live. John Furrier's in our Palo Alto office, banging out that news. Keep it right there, right back after this short break. <laughs>